I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. Well, that meditation and the topic of letting go um, are both very germane to what I'd like to explore with you tonight, which is uh, one of the most practical, interesting, and neurologically engaged topics, really, in uh, Buddhist teachings, which has to do with mindfulness of the hedonic tone, sometimes translated as the feeling tone of experience. Some experiences are pleasant. We like them. Pleasure. Some experiences are unpleasant. Pain. We don't like them. And many experiences are neither pleasurable nor painful. We might say they're, they're neutral. How do we practice with all that? How do we deal with that? Things happen. Burp. We have reactions. And then we have reaction to the reactions to those reactions. How do we manage all that? It's a very, very big, deep topic. And I've explored it with you previously, but I think quite a few years ago, someone uh, nudged me recently to talk about this again. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to be drawing fairly heavily on uh, Bhikkhu Analyo's real masterpiece, Sati Patana. Sati is the Pali word for mindfulness, uh, or mindfulness is the English translation, better put, uh, of the Pali word sati, whose roots etymologically, in terms of language, are in memory, recollected. When we are mindful, we are sustaining present moment recollected awareness. We are not forgetful. We are not distracted. We are not lost in thought. Sati. And we can be mindful of the inner world. We can mind, be mindful of what's happening around us. We can focus our mindfulness into a close, concentrated attention. Or we can open it wide and simply abide in open awareness in which little besides mindfulness is present. Sati, mindfulness. Patana is typically translated as foundations Arguably, as Gil Fronstel points out, it would, would be better translated as establishings or the establishments. Where is mindfulness to be established? In other words, this is not so much the foundations of mindfulness, but where is mindfulness to be founded, to be grounded, to be established? There are four patanas, the establishments, uh, that the Buddha points out. We are to establish mindfulness in an ongoing, granular, detailed awareness of the body in its various postures and movements and sensations. Um, we are to be establishing mindfulness in an ongoing, granular, real-time awareness of the hedonic tones of experience, the feeling tones, even though they're not about emotion per se. And we are, to be, we are to establish mindfulness in an overall awareness of our states of mind, our states of being, um, as contracted and saturated with craving, or as open and released um, and infused with wholesome factors of awakening. That's the third establishing of mindfulness. Um, and then the fourth is to establish mindfulness in a number of important themes in uh, Buddhist uh, ideas and methods, themes such as uh, the four ennobling truths, themes such as uh, the um, um, awakening factors, uh, and other things, the so-called dharmas. Okay? So, establishings. And uh, Sati Patana, very good, very good, great, great. I see Fran put it there. Yep, There's a, there are other texts that are instructional, but for, I don't even know, less than I think a thousand words, we're talking three or four pages, uh, it's pretty darn practical. Now, this text comes down to us, the Sati Patana, 
uh, sutta or sutra, uh, initially orally. It probably evolved to some extent during the Buddha's own lifetime, a collection of teachings gathered together, and then handed down orally. So probably a certain amount of noise crept into that signal, a certain amount of editing, okay, fine. And then eventually, several centuries after the Buddha died, um, a written record survived that then was itself adapted to some extent, but it's more or less has got stabilized at that point. So take it with a grain of salt, and as the Buddha taught himself, see for yourself what rings true, what seems correct, and what seems especially useful for you. Also, these teachings uh, are framed as instructions to a male monastic gathering. So the language is gendered and situated in that context. Uh, uh, Northern India, uh, very hierarchical culture, uh, 2,500 years ago. I'm going to edit the language, um, and I'm going to take a little license with it, uh, to situate it, uh, I think, in, in ways that are more inclusive in general for our time and our place. Okay. Uh, I see a question coming in from Sarah, 51 minutes past the hour. Is a patana more like a reflection on these states, or is it just an awareness? So if I follow you, Sarah, it is, one way to put it is mindfulness of. So mindfulness of the body and body sensations, mindfulness of hedonic tones, mindfulness of global states of consciousness, qualities of being, and mindfulness of a variety of important teachings and themes as they are appearing in your own case. Mindfulness of. And so we, another way of putting it though, is this less dualistic of a witness of something, is that increasingly uh, the, the, the stability of presence is embedded increasingly in body sensations, in hedonic tones, in overall states of consciousness. So it's kind of both of those, mindfulness of and mindfulness in. Okay, so now I'm going to read a bit of um, Nalio's translation, pretty consistent with other really leading translations of the Buddhist canon, including the Satipatthana Sutta. And here it goes, All right? So, thus have I heard. This is the voice of the Buddha's attendant and cousin Ananda, who apparently had an extraordinary oral memory and was essentially saying what he heard. So, I kind of like that. Really puts it in a place, right? Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One, this is the framing of the, these scriptures. Uh, the Blessed One was living in the Kuru country and so forth, and then he addressed the people there. People, and I'm translating monks for people. Venerable Sir, they replied. The Buddha said this. People, this is the direct path for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of dukkha and discontent, dukkha being the fact that some experiences are unpleasant, all pleasant experiences end eventually, and all experiences are inherently impermanent, insubstantial, and lacking any absolute essence or identity, and therefore being incapable of providing any sort of permanent um, happiness because they're continuously changing. Okay? Dukkha. This is the method for the disappearance of dukkha and discontent. This is the direct path for acquiring the true method for the realization of Nibbana, namely the four Satipatthanas. The Buddha is saying, this is really important. So, what are the four? Here, people, in regard to the body, a person abides contemplating the body, diligent, clearly knowing, and mindful, free from desires and discontent in regard to the world, letting go. In regard to feelings, the hedonic tones, 
not emotions per se. You are to contemplate feelings, diligent, clearly knowing, and mindful, free from desires and discontent in regard to the world. In regard to the mind, overall, you are to abide contemplating it, diligent, clearly knowing, and mindful, free from desires and discontent in regard to the world. In regard to these various themes, dhammas, you are to abide contemplating these themes, diligent, clearly knowing, and mindful, free from desires and discontent in regard to the world. Now, one way to relate to that teaching is, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, heard it all before. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And another way to relate to it is that pick your, pick your, uh, pick your metaphor, a doctor or a coach or a very trusted friend is telling you, hey, this is how to do it. Hey, this works. Worked for me, worked for lots of people. It's going to work for you. Give it a try and see for yourself if it works. And that, I think, is a really good way to relate to this. So we have some key words here. Abiding, stably, stably established, stably established in mindfulness, abiding, diligent, we bring some muscularity to it. We stick with it, we persevere. We, we value it. We bring some discipline to it, diligent. Clearly knowing, not spacing out, kind of fuzzy, you know, pink clouds, soft edges. Clearly knowing, alert, perceptive, clearly knowing. And free of desires and discontent in regard to the world. That has to do with the broader project of renunciation, disengagement. Um, there may well be desires and discontent uh, in regard to the world, but they don't invade us and hijack us. We're not ruminating about them while we're doing this practice that he describes. In the core of the practice, desires and discontents related to our worldly life are not intruding. That's a way to understand that. They're not hijacking us. Okay? We're, we're doing this practice and we're training our minds in this way. So in that frame then, we have mindfulness of the hedonic tones, feelings. So here we go. And how people, should you, in regard to feelings, abide contemplating feelings, hedonic tones? Here, when a pleasant here, when feeling a pleasant feeling, you should know I feel a pleasant feeling. When feeling an unpleasant feeling, you should know I feel an unpleasant feeling. When feeling a neutral feeling, you should know I feel a neutral feeling. What's interesting is how simple the Buddha keeps making it. It's not esoteric, it's not metaphysical, no white light involved. Hey. Wake up, he's telling us. When you're present, be present. Be established in what you're experiencing, knowing it as you experience it. So he continues. When feeling a worldly pleasant feeling, you should know, I feel a worldly pleasant feeling. When feeling an unworldly pleasant feeling, you should know, I feel an unworldly pleasant feeling. Here the Buddha is making a dualistic distinction between Ordinary pleasures, having a meal with friends, um, your sports team you know, wins a football game, uh, you get something done and you feel really happy about it, fine. And unworldly has to do more with um, pleasurable experiences on the path of awakening, specifically, including those that are involved in increasingly um, intense uh, meditative states contemplative states, which can be increasingly saturated with uh, sukha and PT, increasingly saturated with happiness and bliss on the path to 
uh, tipping into some very non-ordinary states of awareness that in, are involved in the uh, right concentration element of the Eightfold Path called the jhanas. Okay, so the distinction is there. Unworldly is not about transcending ordinary reality. Uh, it's, the Buddha is not framing it like that. He's talking about experiences in this body, in this world, that have a purposefulness to them. They're, they're in the service of awakening. Okay. And then he makes this distinction further with regard to worldly and unworldly, unpleasant feelings and neutral feelings. Okay. Throughout, the point is, um, we are, t in regard to our feelings, these hedonic tones, we are to abide contemplating them internally, externally, and internally and externally. That phrasing has given pause to many people. It could be a bit of noise coming into the signal here. One way to understand it, though, is that we can be aware of what we're experiencing from the inside out, and we can also contemplate it more from the outside in, taking into account external factors that are producing those hedonic tones of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral in us, internally and externally, and both internally and externally. That's a way to understand that. So we are we abide contemplating, being aware of these hedonic tones, and in particular, we abide contemplating the nature of arising, the sense of something as pleasurable or unpleasant arises, all right? And then it passes away. But it really emphasizes that we bring that insight, that vipassana, into our mindfulness of hedonic tones. That's really useful. I'll get into that more later, but this recognition of the inherent impermanence, the arising, the passing away, and the inherent conditioned causality of, the sourcing of, the sense of things as pleasurable and, and unpleasant or painful, that's really useful. And I'll get into that in a bit. Um, great. Finishing up here, mindfulness that there is feeling, there is a hedonic tone. Mindfulness that there is feeling is established in you to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and continuous mindfulness in deeper and deeper states of meditation. You're just present with it. You may note it during meditative practice. You might say, this is pleasant, or you might just, just say, you know, note in your mind with a soft word, painful, unpleasant, liking, not liking, or without language. You might simply be aware of the ongoing streaming in consciousness of hedonic tones. And then the Buddha finishes here. And thus you abide independent. You abide independently, not clinging to anything in the world. Right. Abiding independently, not clinging to anything in the world, and not clinging to uh, pleasurable experiences, not clinging to the pleasurableness of experiences, and not fighting with or running from or freezing around the painfulness, the unpleasantness of some other experiences. Okay. That's the context. And now, just to really complicate things here, I want to talk about how all this is going down in your brain uh, based on plausible, tentative, neuroscience is a baby science, plausible accounts of what's going on in your brain. So I want to speak first, though, to a question, if I understand it, uh, from Elaine, if I can um, find it here again briefly. 
Yes, at three minutes past the hour, you can see it in the chat. So feeling and awareness are separate, but can you feel without being aware? Great. So uh, let's get all get linguistically murky, try to keep it simple. In this model that I'm sharing here that makes sense to me from the inside and the outside, um, there, we, there is awareness. That we are aware of things. Um, <clears throat> and we can be aware of the fact that there's a pleasantness or an unpleasantness. There's a pleasureness, an enjoyability, a likability to certain experiences, um, a dislikability to others. Sometimes they're mixed together, like in hot sauce, you know, on your taco. Uh, and we can be aware of that. So we're aware of that. We're mindful of that. Um, so they're distinct. There is awareness and there's awareness of, okay? Can we have um, hedonic experiences without being conscious? I suspect that when people are anesthetized, there is at some level, you know, a processing in the brain of pain, or perhaps, but there's no awareness of it at that time at least. So we, but on the whole, on the whole, besides those kind of edge cases, uh, we're, a, we're, a, we're conscious. We may not be very mindful, but if we're feeling pain, you know, we are conscious. We're not unconscious, right? So we, we must be aware there, uh, in order to feel pain. We may not be very mindfully aware. It may be happening in the background uh, without much focused mindfulness of it. But, you know, if we're having experiences in the streaming of consciousness, well, there must also be consciousness in the sense of awareness at the time. Okay, so back now to the brain. I'm going to summarize some stuff pretty fast here and then get really practical. In your brain, my brain, it's very complicated. It has these various parts. The various parts often cluster together functionally. In, but the best way to understand this is not so much in terms of the parts of the brain that are involved, but in terms of uh, their functional relationships with each other. That said, uh, we have three major networks that are relevant here. One network is called the salience network. It's tracking the relevance of things. That which is really pleasurable or really painful or might be painful, that's very relevant. Stuff that's neither pleasurable nor painful, not so relevant. Uh, so basically the amygdala, there are two of them, hippocampus, two of those, um, probably the basal ganglia also in the mix, deep in the subcortex in the brain, guided to some extent by other parts of the brain. They're tracking the relevance, the salience of what you're experiencing. And if something is relevant, salient, uh, then that network rip, signals uh, the what's called task positive network, the more of the executive functions of the brain. Hey, something matters. We better do something about it. So then we have the so-called task positive network, more in the foreground of the prefrontal cortex, drawing on portions to the side, to some extent drawing on um, other parts of your brain. I should have added that the insula is often also involved in the salience network as it tracks the internal state of your body. So the task positive network, the executive functions related to that, they get engaged. And off to the sidelines, we have the so-called default mode network, the midline toward the rear, where I think of it as the simulator, the ruminator, in which we kind of space out and we're doing mental time travel about the past and the future and reflecting on things, uh, maybe pleasant, maybe unpleasant, but, you know, we don't need to kick it into gear yet. And then, boom, some signal comes to us from the salience network. Wow, pay attention. And then we're, we're out of the default mode and into doing something, more or less. In all that, there's a deep teaching that in the Buddhist tradition that I've kind of alluded to already neurologically, in which we're engaging with various stimuli, internal stimuli and external stimuli. The Buddha called that contact. We're con awareness is continually contacting stimuli. 
Then after contact in the sequence flow is the hedonic tone. There's bare awareness of something that's happened and then there's the hedonic tone of it. To some extent shaped by how we categorize it. On the heels of that can be craving and then clinging and suffering in this very familiar sequence. Contact, hedonic tone, craving, clinging, suffering. And in between contact, in between the, rather, in between the feeling tone of an experience and craving, whew, is a space in which over time and with practice, there is choice and freedom. And in this enormously important second establishing of mindfulness, in the hedonic tones, the feeling tones of experience, in that training is the building of that space, the building of that shock absorber in which we have choice. In that space, we can, in the middle way, we can enjoy what is pleasurable. We can tolerate and not be aversive about that which is unpleasant. We can do that. Without that space, the hedonic tone moves very rapidly into different forms of craving. Craving expressed as fighting with what's unpleasant, craving expressed as clinging, you know, or grasping after, getting addicted to, pursuing at great cost that which is pleasurable, or clinging in our relationships with other people. So real-time granular mindfulness of our own reactions to the pleasantness or unpleasantness of our experiences is incredibly useful because it's the foundation of our freedom. Otherwise, we are puppets being pulled this way or that in our reactions to the pleasantness or unpleasantness of our experiences. So how do we train? How do we, how do we um, put this to practical use? So first of all, um, by being mindful of the kind of ongoing sequence of like this, dislike that, and then what? That helps us become more at choice and more in freedom. So this training in real-time awareness of the pleasantness and unpleasantness of experience and what happens next is one of the most practical applications of mindfulness. And I really commend it to you. If there's something that would be a service in practice in very psychological terms, it's to be really aware of what happens when you find yourself liking an experience. What happens when you find yourself disliking Something happens with your friend, your partner, in your body. You don't like it. It's unpleasant. Maybe it's scary. Maybe it hurts. Maybe you feel hurt by what somebody did. Okay, there it is. Then what? Incredibly useful. Then what? Okay. <clears throat> So, second, besides this granular deepening awareness of the sequence, right, from um, unpleasant or pleasant to reactivity, it's really helpful to deepen insight into the inherent impermanence of pleasure and pain. Now, pain may have a chronic quality to it. And yet, if you look really closely at the experience that's painful, your back hurts, there's heartache emotionally over the loss of a loved one, maybe you feel remorse about something you've done in a relationship, maybe you feel resentful about how somebody has treated you, maybe you're angry. I had some like 
anger arise. Uh, anger might be too strong a word. Earlier today, when someone um, repeatedly uh, did something improper and kind of in my business world, uh, you know, can we recognize the inherent impermanence of what is painful? Or as I was saying, even when it, the feeling sticks around, you look at the parts of it and they're vibrating, they're dynamic, they're changing. We tend to ossify, we tend to cement, concretize, reify, blah, blah, essentialize, blah, blah. I'm searching for a simpler word. We tend to like thingify, my friend Daniel Ellenberg's term. We tend to thingify our pleasures and pains and turn them into objects to be fought with or grasped and possessed. And the Buddha's counsel is to know, recognize their impermanence. Think of them as clouds in the sky of awareness, coming and going, and develop over time greater disenchantment and detachment from pleasures and pains, per se. And they're okay. The middle way, enjoy your pleasures, cope with your pains without adding a lot of stuff to it. Third, the Buddha talks about uprooting our latent tendencies toward um, the traditional word is lust. I don't think I'll use desire in the problematic sense. Um, greediness, you know, for pleasures, I'll use that word. Or our latent tendencies toward um, irritation, irritability, or anxiety. Or our latent tendencies toward spacing out when it's neutral, dissociating, just going away, if it's not compelling, getting bored really quickly, if it's just neutral, and needing something to happen, even if it's annoying. Um, so where do these latent tendencies come from? This is, and what do we do about them? Now, this is the territory, for example, of trauma. Trauma. Life to experiences. The brain is designed to learn from its experiences, especially painful ones. Also, these latent tendencies can be located externally in our environment, society. If the world is continually picking on you for real, mistreating you, well, yeah, you're going to develop latent tendencies toward freezing in the face of that overwhelming mistreatment or anger or tendencies to be anxious about it. Um, and also if your body is sick or you know, is inclined toward depressed mood or has chronic pain that understandably makes a person kind of irritable and exasperated and prickly, or if you have an understandable fear of worsening, you, they, you know, you're not anxious as long as you stay inside your very small window of tolerance, well, of course, those latent tendencies are going to be at work. There's no discussion of trauma that I can find in the Pali Canon, the early teachings of the Buddha. Maybe there is, and how to deal with it. Maybe there is some that, you know, other people like Jim French can find out for us or other folks uh, who are scholarly here. Uh, but uh, nor is there much discussion of how external factors can create um, these so-called latent tendencies. Um, vulnerabilities could be another way to put it, uh, toward reactivity to what's pleasant or unpleasant. Um, but I want to take them into account. It's important to take them into account. Meanwhile, the Buddha keeps focusing on internal psychological mental factors. So one thing we can kind of look at in our inquiry, and this is where I think a lot of modern psychotherapeutic methods, including those from Asia, there's a lot of fantastic therapeutic methods coming out of that have come out of Japan and other non-Western cultures, uh, as well as obviously the tremendously wise and practical teachings uh, that are indigenous, First, First Nations people around the world. We can draw on these and to apply them to our own latent tendencies. Uh, and then over time, what starts to happen is that we recognize that we have these kind of inner turbochargers that take something that's unpleasant and make us really angry about it. We add a proportion to how unpleasant it actually is. Or can take something that feels threatening and make us really anxious or really frozen and immobilized 
in reaction to it, way out of proportion to what it really is. Over time, we can learn to recognize those turbochargers. We can name them to ourselves and realize, wow, it seems so real, but they're distorting. They're distorting, uh, they're, they're amplifying my reactivity here, and I need to regulate that, and they are distorting and biasing my views, and I need to correct for that. And they're leading me into impulsive actions toward others that I want to restrain until things settle down a little bit. We can learn about these underlying latent tendencies and become more skillful with regard to them. Um, I have an underlying latent tendency uh, rooted in you know being young, going through school, of feeling like an outsider in groups of cool kids. And even though rationally, I know that I'm an insider, let's say, in some gathering, it's kind of easy for my mind to start shifting in to that familiar way of being, going all the way back to little Ricky, you know, in fourth grade or third grade or junior high school, who just felt like invisible and an outsider. That's a latent tendency. So then if any little thing happens, like someone's talking to me and then they look away and they start looking around the room while I'm talking to them, uh, you know, I've got that latent tendency, uh, uh, you know, that, that uh, in, implicit memory system in my body that that unpleasantness of feeling disregarded can connect with. So because I have this point, as I ought to by, the, by now, some self-knowledge, uh, I can be aware of that and even can actually anticipate that sort of turbocharging or distorting um, qualities in my own, you know, mind. Uh, so that's a, an example of the kind of practice we can do here. Then I want to offer a couple more and then see if you have a, some questions about this. Uh, let's see. I, th I think I'm up to number four. A deep inquiry, a deep inquiry is to ask yourself, who feels? Who likes? Who dislikes? Who's bored? Huh. Which is an inquiry into self. This is very cool and useful. Because very often, the sense of a kind of clogged, condensed, pulled together me uh, gets in the mix of liking. I really like that. I really hate that. You know, the I, right, gets involved. And you can explore the difference between you know, I like compared to this is pleasant or there is a pleasant feeling tone, All right? That's different. Or you can compare, I hate that or I'm scared of that, contrasted to, oh, that hurts or that's unpleasant or, oh, that's threatening. It's really different. So it's a deep inquiry. And notice how often we um, self, we, pers we, we take personally uh, that which is um, pleasant or unpleasant, or we claim it as our own, right? And then we get involved with it, we identify with it, we want to possess it, we want to maintain it, we want to keep becoming it. That whole project starts unfolding. So this inquiry, who feels, who likes, who dislikes, Who's bored? That's really useful. And then last, um, as Bhikkhu Analio puts it, we can decondition over time with practice our hedonic tones at their source as they initially arise. So as we get closer and closer to the real time of that movement in often less than a second from stimulus to hedonic tone, contact to feeling. As we become more aware there and we start recognizing the impermanent, insubstantial, empty, um, unowned, unowned nature of pleasures and pains, 
They become kind of liberated as they arise, and we don't crystallize opinions around them. We don't crystallize viewpoints around them. They simply are. They keep unfolding. On the other side of enlightenment, the Buddha still experienced pain. He still experienced joy. Uh, He still experienced pleasure. He was described as the happy one because as our afflictions fall away, what remains is, is like a loving, peaceful contentment and happiness. Um, not a big blank. So um, feeling tones continue, including otherworldly or not, you know, or engaged with awakening uh, pleasures. Those certainly persist. Um, but we don't have to develop, um, we don't have to identify with them and develop a lot of opinions about them as we get closer and closer to their arising at their source. Okay. So if I were to sum up, recognizing in the real time the ongoing process of liking and disliking, it's understandable, it's okay, it arises. Likes arise, dislikes arise. There are pleasures, there are pains, and there is a lot that's that's sort of neutral and neither. Fine. Allowing it to unfold without as much as possible adding our own problematic reactivity to what we like or dislike. Being skillful. The likability of many things is an indicator of their value to us. So we look to ways to encourage them and maintain them and support them, but without identifying with it, without contracting around it, without trying to possess it in ways that are problematic. Much the same way, some things are painful. We try to minimize pain in other people appropriate to trying to minimize that in ourselves in reasonable and skillful ways. It's okay. It's okay. When I go on retreat, you know, if I'm having a headache that's getting in the way of my meditation because I haven't had any coffee, Advil. Yes, skillful means no shame, at least for me. Um, So, you know, we do skillful things, right? But that's really different from getting angry because we're sad or building a case against other people uh, and really getting caught up in our opinions about it all and our righteousness about it all because they, um, they let us down. Uh, as someone let me down earlier today. Uh, see, that's, that's really central here. And then if you're into it, and I recommend it in your own movement, your own path of awakening, um, get more and more into real time uh, in which you're aware of thing, pleasures and pains and all the other flotsam and jetsam rolling down the stream of consciousness, just more stuff rolling along, and recognizing the impermanence and the emptiness, the insubstanti- insubstantialness, insubstantiality of all the flotsam and jetsam in your awareness. Yeah, getting closer and closer to that and more and more of a in it without being attached to it, you know? Um, yeah, and increasingly undoing and undermining the the personalizing, the selfing of that which is pleasant or unpleasant. That's really useful. Uh, and over time, um, really undoing and undermining the opinions and viewpoints that get caught up in what's pleasant or unpleasant. You really think about so many fundamental teachings of the Buddha, they're really contained in this inquiry that we've been engaged in here. And um, I'll just finish, I think, and I won't have time for questions, I think, tonight. But I just want to finish by with a kind of a personal note, which is that as I um, talk about this and feel it in myself. And I just recognize in myself how vulnerable we are. You know, we're designed. That sequence, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, (laughs) we're just suffering. We're designed as creatures with a nervous system honed 
in brutal, harsh conditions for 600 million years. We are designed to rocket through that sequence. You know, the monkey likes it, wants to get it, own it, possess it, and keep it. The monkey doesn't like it. The monkey, boom, moves right away into freezing or fleeing or, if necessary, fighting. Boom. And if not the monkey, the mouse or the lizard or, in its own version, the spider. We're vulnerable to all this, right? And just think how much suffering uh, cascades from that sequence. Contact, feeling, craving, clinging, suffering. So it takes diligence, as the Buddha taught in his opening refrain to the Satipatthana uh, Sutra. Uh, It takes diligence to practice with this. And also, this is the part where I'm speaking really in my own reflection here, it really behooves us to recognize how vulnerable other people are to that sequence. And to cut them some slack (laughs) because they're not enlightened yet. You know, they get caught up, they get sucked down that path really fast, just like we're biologically designed to. They get reactive to words we use and things we do. And and my point about this is just to suggest for ourselves to tread more lightly on others, you know, tread more lightly in this world and, you know, have some spaciousness and understanding for the vulnerability of others to that sequence that moves from contact to feeling to to craving to clinging to suffering and to tread lightly on them to the extent we reasonably can to the extent we reasonably can not get caught up in manipulating their desires uh, or intimidating their fears uh, you know the better the better And I think there, there's a place for a kind of reassurance that we kind of radiate a field of reassurance as we move through the world. It's been something that's been a real domain of practice for me in the last really many years. An appropriate, not obsequious, not walking on eggshells, not placating, but a field of reassurance. You know, The Buddha teaches uh, to, to radiate a quality that says, I come in peace. Right, um, I'm not here to hurt you. Uh, I come in goodwill. I come in good faith. I'm going to protect my interests. I'm going to take care of those I care about, um, which can be a very, very big circle. But I'm not here to hurt you or harm you. You know, radiating that kind of re- reassuring that can help to reduce the reactivity um, that others are vulnerable to uh, in their own reactions to what feels good or what doesn't feel so good. I just kind of wanted to leave that as a, as a finishing thought for you.